something else is going on. And I think I mentioned this real briefly, very briefly, the Vietnam War. And in your head, we think rioting, right? Frequently, what might you associate the rioting with? Anti-war. Anti but you would be wrong. This rioting is not anti-war. This is mainly urban, and it is almost always focused on some type of economic conditions. You are not seeing rioting over the Vietnam War. So if it's not associated with the Vietnam War, then we go back here, and it's not people aren't angry about the Vietnam War. They will become so, but the tide changes in 1969. And why is that date important? Because who is already elected? Nixon. Nixon. The 1968 campaign is not about Vietnam. You read their, um, their press releases, you watch the television commercials that they're using, and it's about law and order. That's the argument. Vietnam is not an issue. When Nixon gets involved, and again, this is very complicated, because when we think of Nixon, we associate him with rock, Watergate, and so we associate scandal and all sorts of naughtiness, which may be so. But what you don't remember is why he gets elected. He comes in in 68, uh, by 69, the tide changes. And we think of Nixon as a Republican, but don't get me wrong, he's not, uh, don't be confused here, it's not necessarily a conservative. He doesn't actually change the federal money. He leaves it. So when modern Reaganite types talk about Ray, uh, Nixon, they don't particularly like Nixon. They like the law and order. But he doesn't really change anything that really differentiated the Republicans and the Democrats at this time, which was this money. Now, why doesn't Nixon want to change the federal money, all these programs, the Great Society programs, the War and Property programs. Why doesn't he come in and end all this? You guys know the answer to this. What would happen if Nixon comes in and then ends all the War and Poverty programs? He loses the urban vote. Yes, he loses the urban vote and he is called, he's racist, right? I mean, that, that shift is, is very effective. And so the, the, the Democrat, Republicans cannot challenge that. It becomes what I mentioned before. Remember the third rail? That, that one on the subway, the third rail is electric rail. You can't touch that. And so Nixon is a Republican, but he doesn't change that. He does not stop. And so that's one of the reasons why the great society is so influential. Even though, in a sense, this great society, which basically promises to end poverty, how successful is it? Of course. In fact, the numbers, to some extent, either are the constant or, in some cases, increased. Certainly, in the 1970s, they increased. So it doesn't. It's not successful. Nevertheless, you cannot change or challenge it politically. It's just it's too risky. So the Democrats did this amazing thing. LBJ does this. But that doesn't mean LBJ is safe. Because by associating poverty and race, he is kind of buying into some of this argument that says it is the money that is causing this inequality. How much farther does that take for some radical to say, yeah, that's absolutely true, and it's the whole system, man. The whole capitalist system which is causing the inequality, so we've got to get rid of it. Now, yeah, only that many people actually buy that. Most of the country is much more on the moderate side. Saying, well, okay, I like the federal, I'm not going to get rid of capitalism, but I like giving more money to the federal. We can try to fix it that way. I mentioned a long time ago that there's a difference between, say, conservative, liberal, and radical. And what you were seeing in the late 60s, early 70s, were the radicals fighting against the liberals. They weren't fighting against the conservatives. Why not? 
can't change conservatives. Yeah, because they already, they're, as far as they're concerned, the radicals are concerned, these guys already don't like the federal action. They don't want that, so we're not changing. What we're changing is the degree to which the liberal, who already wants to use an active federal government, the degree to which they want to use that power to kind of undermine the system. That's where that conflict comes from. So in 1968, the very famous riots, Chicago riots in 1968, is not outside of the Republican Democrat uh, convention, it's outside of the Democratic convention, national convention. They're rioting against the Democrats. The Republicans had a fairly easy primary convention. Okay. So the Vietnam War becomes an issue in 69. And then, very interesting, who gets us out of the Vietnam War? Nixon gets us out of the Vietnam War. Nixon, as I mentioned, actually fairly savvy, politically savvy. He doesn't affect the federal money because he doesn't want to get that perception of being racist. He knows that people are now changing their views on Vietnam, so he begins to extract. And we start extraction by 1970, that quickly. By 1972, we have about 90% out. By 73, we are pretty much gone. And when I say pretty much gone, that means that there's literally a few hundred people there that are in administrative positions just helping the North or South Vietnamese. By 1975, North Vietnam, with Chinese officers and Soviet weapons, invade South Vietnam. That's when South Vietnam destroys. Very sad, actually. Why is it sad? I think I mentioned this. One million people killed during this. They invade. There's nobody there. The United States isn't there. We pulled out two years earlier. And then they rounded up anybody that was in opposition, and they killed them. There's a movie done in the early 80s called The Killing Fields where literally there's just these fields just filled, filled with bodies. So when this happens, what is our view of Vietnam? Did we win or did we lose? Well, three objectives to Vietnam. And I'm not going to spend too much time because I want to deal with something else today. Three objectives. Number one, is the old classic objective, which is containment. So we have to contain spread of Soviet Sino bloc into Southeast Asia. In fact, the same containment. Soviet Sino bloc around the globe, right? Isn't that kind of the whole essence of the Cold War? In fact, these probably should be reversed. It's the globe, and then locally Southeast Asia. And then what's the last objective? Protect Vietnam. South Vietnam. So which ones fail? This one. But what about these two? Did, did China invade Taiwan? Again, this isn't world history, but Taiwan was old China. When the Communist Revolution occurred in China, the leadership moves to Taiwan. That's why Taiwan, they, China calls Taiwan Chinese. They don't recognize them as a state. And Taiwan says that we are the real China, that we're, the China is now underneath a communist kind of a usurper government. They broke away. Part of, the, part of uh, the action of the Allies after 1949 is to make sure that China doesn't attack Taiwan. Did China attack Taiwan? If they had been able to go through and take off this country and that country and this country and that country, what would have stopped them from taking Taiwan? If the world did nothing about it, and what would they expect the world to do if they attacked Taiwan? Nothing. 
but they didn't. Basically, it was limited to Vietnam. What about around the globe? Well, it's a tough one to say. But in the 60s, there wasn't much expansion. What happened after Vietnam? Within about three years, when South Vietnam was defeated by North Vietnam, the United States pulled out of Vietnam. And so you got two years, and then North Vietnam defeats South Vietnam. What happens elsewhere in the world? It's about three years. You guys may not know this. Afghanistan gets invaded by the Soviet Union. During the war, it was contained, but what happens afterwards? This is an iffy one. Although we know in the grand scheme of things, by 1991, what happens? Soviet Union collapses. So did we win the Vietnam War? Uh, it's a hard one because it's not a war, right? And people say, oh, you're being playing semantics by saying it's not a war, it's a police action. When people get shot, it's war. No, no, no. It's not true. <laughs> This is not a war. If we were attacking somebody, we had a very clearly identified enemy, then there wouldn't have been an issue. We never lost any battles in Vietnam. We didn't lose a single battle in Vietnam. But that's not what we, we weren't fighting a war. A police action is mean we're trying to uphold the government. In terms of these objectives, yeah, they, were, they were met. But in terms of this one, it was gone. Of course, we were gone already. It doesn't really matter if we say, did we win, did we lose? What really, really, really matters is the perception. And what's the American perception? Particularly when we find out how many people get killed. So what's the American perception? Yeah, it was a loss. But why? Why did we lose? Are we real? Do we have consensus on why we lost? Should we have been there longer? Should we have never gotten in there? Is there consensus on this issue? If you talk to the radicals, and we somehow associate radicals with anti-war, right? But remember, the radicals are anti-capitalists. They're not anti-war. They're not pacifists. Why do we know this? Because they're blowing things up, right? So they're not pacifists. They're not talking about pacifism. If you look back here, you know, this is Nate Miguel. This is this is kind of a it's a confrontational type of ideology. The Black Panthers. These guys wanted to create a new country in the United States. They took the freedom of uh, arms uh, rights, so they would actually walk around San Francisco with shotguns in military uniforms, in rifles. Well, you can do that, right? There's nothing illegal about it. Now, when somebody's walking like this, back and forth, okay, it gets a little bit disconcerting. But it's their right. And so they were, they were using it to the max. Now, we know now later that they would actually fund their operations by burglarizing houses in the middle of the night. Then they'd use that money, and then they would fund their stuff. So these guys are not peaceful guys. The anti-war demonstrations, this is something, I don't know if you understand why people are upset with Jane Fonda. Whoopsie. This is Jane Fonda. Where is she? She's got a hat on because, you know, cute girl, she puts, you know how some girl, they take the guy's hat and put it on, very sweet, right? Well, but who are these guys? Yeah, which military? North. North. Vietnam. This is North Vietnam. She went over basically to tour the North Vietnamese. She's sitting on, uh, this is a picture she goes on later, she's sitting on an aircraft uh, destroyer. Uh, a, a, basically a gun, anti-aircraft gun. She's sitting on one of the guns that blows out the pilots. She went to tour the Vietnam uh, POW camps. And so they each give her notes. She collects all these notes and she shakes their hands saying, oh yeah, these guys are treated really, really well. No, they're not. Of course, they're being tortured. But they said, oh, we treat them well. And she's accepting them. They take all these notes. When she gets all these notes, she hands them to the commandant. Whose side is she on here? It'd be like having some American starlet go over and have pictures with the Taliban or Al-Qaeda. 
So Osama bin Laden, you know, putting his turban on her head. Oh, isn't that cute? Does this get people really, really upset? Does the American public see this? This isn't anti-war. What is this? It's anti-American side on this war. She's literally rooting for the enemy. Now, is this what everybody who's against the war is saying? No. But when you have a vocal minority, it doesn't take very much to make that type of an association. The most of the majority of people, and again, this is a funny thing, more people drafted or enlisted in Vietnam? Enlisted. Enlisted. That's not in our brains. We don't think that. In our brains, people are dragged, kicking, and screaming to the war. Why would people enlist? This is a shock in our 2014. This is not a shock in 1965. Why would people enlist? To avoid going to the front lines. Why do we, we haven't had a draft in 20 years? Why do people enlist today, knowing they very well could be sent off to Iraq? This is a really easy answer. Patriotism. Patriotism! They want to fight and protect their country. I know this is hard for us to understand, right? But they're doing this during Vietnam also. In our brain, this vocal minority kind of takes over. We assume everybody hates the war. All kids hate it. They're all radicals. No, we're dealing with a tiny minority, but a very vocal minority. Jane Fonda does not represent the America. It does not represent the Democratic Party. But it doesn't take that much for the association to be applied with. I said, today, you think Republicans. In your head, sometimes, you associate Republicans with somehow being against civil rights, or in some cases, even racist. Now, it's ridiculous, right? Well, today, when we think of Democrats, what comes in our head? Radical sometimes? Anti-American sometimes? Now, is it true? Does it, is, it, is it accurate? Any more accurate than the other? No. But where does it stem from? It stems from very real events. And all you need to do is make that association. And then it's very difficult to change it. Here, it's been 40 plus years. 1970, 40 plus years. 45 almost. That is the association. Will this change? Yes, undoubtedly it will. We see these changes happen all the time. But who's probably going to die before this change occurs? baby boomers. You guys are probably the 